Welcome to the last webinar of the year of the Space Diplomacy Lab Rethinking Diplomacy Program. Uh, I'm Giovanni Zanalda uh, at Duke University. The uh, event today uh, is Orbital Police, how open source intelligence can aid diplomacy and space norms in low earth orbit and beyond. It's a conversation with uh, the, our distinguished uh, guest, uh, Dr. Uh, Jonathan uh, McDowell. And uh, I want just to mention a couple of things about the, today's event. Uh, it's, a very, it's very nice that we have a full participation from the Space Diplomacy Lab members, so which uh, represent a good spectrum of what we are interested in, since we have uh, Professor Lundgren, who is an astronomer, Dr. Lindsey Gray, who is a scientist, uh, a AAAS fellow at the State Department, Dr. Schmidt, who is an astrophysicist, and Ambassador Pearson, who is an ambassador, so diplomacy and uh, science are getting together. Uh, today's event is going to be uh, the usual event we have, a conversation. So uh, uh, Dr. McDowell will open with uh, remarks, and then uh, we will have a couple of questions from, uh, the, from the team. And then we open uh, the Q&A uh, function to all the members, attendees, who would like to submit questions. Uh, you please use the Q&A function. And uh, you can ask questions throughout the event, and we will start asking as soon as possible. Uh, Dr. Schmidt will introduce the event and uh, also our distinguished uh, guest speaker. Thank you very much, and uh, Dr. Uh, Benjamin. Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you, everybody, uh, and welcome to uh, what will be the, the last Space Diplomacy Lab of 2022, but we will be back uh, next month very, uh, very rapidly with our, our next event, so stay tuned. Uh, but for 2022, this is our, uh, we'll call it the annual finale, or uh, but but uh, not not uh, not serious for now. We'll keep keep going in a few weeks. So uh, welcome everyone, and great to see you all on uh, this uh, Friday morning, uh, at least East Coast time. So since the onset of Russia's large scale invasion of Ukraine in February 2022, the wide array of readily available data sets from commercial space platforms have allowed the world to understand the ongoing dynamics of both the military conflict and related civil and humanitarian issues in unprecedented levels of detail. This includes satellite imagery and data sets that have been able to help diplomats better understand issues from characterizing potential war crimes committed by the Russian military to the status of agreements by the Kremlin to allow Ukraine to export vital grain supplies to help avert global food crises. Additionally, with the official start of winter just days away and below freezing temperatures on tap for Kyiv in the coming weeks, Dramatic NASA Worldview satellite imagery data uh, released in late November show a nationwide blackout from Lviv to Kharkiv, from Kyiv to Kherson, owing to continued Russian kinetic attacks on Ukrainian civil energy infrastructure. So what do all these examples have in common uh, is that unlike in previous large scale conflicts, which relied on slowly declassified satellite data released from official government sources around the world, the data reaching us now both uh, to the expert community, the academic community, uh, the media and general public is captured and rapidly released by commercial entities operating powerful multispectral imagers in low earth orbit and beyond. In practice, this has meant a renaissance for what we call open source intelligence, open source data sets coming from uh, space tools, uh, space platforms, which can aid not only public understanding of the events unfolding on the ground, but also serve as powerful tools for diplomats and aid workers attempting to support humanitarian efforts and also folks that are tracking what's going on above our heads. And that's why we have an expert here today to talk about this. So we are joined today by Dr. John McDowell, astrophysicist at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, my colleague here, um, on the role that both government-sponsored sa science satellites and commercial orbital imaging platforms now play in supporting vital open source intelligence work covering a wide array of issues from geopolitical trends and humanitarian assistance delivery to managing contingencies in space like orbital traffic management and space debris tracking. Dr. McDowell studies black holes, quasars, and X-ray sources in galaxies, as well as supporting the development of data analysis and software for the X-ray astronomy community. Dr. McDowell has a BA in mathematics uh, and PhD in astrophysics from the University of, of Cambridge in England. After postdocs at Jordel Bank, uh, Bank um, 
CFA and NASA Marshall Space Flight Center. He came back to the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics here in Cambridge, Massachusetts to work on uh, the Einstein archive and then join the team leading efforts for the Chandra X-ray Observatory, part of NASA's Great Observatories program. Um, uh, he currently leads the group uh, uh, which plans and tests the science analysis software for the Chandra Space Telescope. Scientific publications include uh, studies in cosmology, black holes, merging galaxies, quasars, and asteroids. He's also the editor of Jonathan Space Report, a free internet newsletter founded in about uh, 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 mid-1989, which provides technical details of satellite launches and is a well-respected leading commentator for major media outlets on spacecraft activity in low Earth orbit and beyond. Uh, so with that, um, I'm going to open with one question to Jonathan McDowell uh, to, to kick off his, uh, his opening remarks and, um, and, and also uh, explain why uh, the title of this event is what it is. Uh, he, uh, uh, I think about a year or two ago, commented, commented on, a, on Twitter on a, a certain uh, billionaire's uh, Tesla Roadster and what, where it was, it, uh, it wasn't exactly orbiting right around Mars. And another commenter said, who died and made you orbital police? So the question is, Jonathan, who died and made you orbital police? <laughs> right. Uh, well, my answer at that point was Johannes Kepler, which people seem to like. But uh, re really, the story go is a bit more recent. Uh, and, and I want to talk a little bit about you know open source intelligence about space. And this really goes back to, to the Cold War. Uh, and uh, when I was when I was a kid, and you know, I, I'm old enough to just remember the Apollo landings, and that made me think of space as as one of the most important historical events in our lifetimes. Uh, and it was hard to get information about it growing up in England, where the media weren't really that interested in it. But there was this group called the British Interplanetary Society. Uh, which was founded by people like Arthur C. Clarke in the 30s, uh, but and in the, the 70s and 80s was really pioneering a lot of what we now call open source intelligence in, in, in the space community. It had uh, it did a lot of uh, radio intercepts uh, of, of Russian satellites and, and figured out what they were up to. And as a result, um, uh, there was sort of a community uh, building around sharing information about what was really going on uh, in, in space. And I became part of that as a teenager. Uh, and uh, when I moved to the United States in the late 80s, uh, I joined the, the Smithsonian Observatory here, uh, which had been a source of information for outer space uh, uh, in the 19, late 1950s when Sputnik went up, but had sort of left that role. And and the uh, the public affairs people still got questions from the public that that no one at CFA knew how to answer except me. So I started making this newsletter about what's been going on in, in uh, satellites this week, uh, and thought maybe you know a couple people might be interested. But it turns out that that there was a lot of interest out there, and so that was in the you know days when the uh, where it was internet but not yet web uh the uh i i became essentially the journal of record for what's really going on and my brand has been to try and be as objective as possible not to sort of project my own politics into the uh um the newsletter uh but to be a resource that people can go and say what really happened that you know military and peace groups can both be happy with a uh, quoting uh you know Europeans and Americans are gonna uh not feel I'm shortchanging either uh and so uh with my international upbringing a a uh you know an international view uh an academic view an independent view uh not beholden to any of the space agencies of uh what's really happening in space and so my orbital police role has been more broadly uh not just giving space billionaires a hard time I've, I've, i'm afraid i've been in twitter arguments with at least three um, but uh uh but also the space agencies when they make a claim like 
oh, this is the first skip re-entry from the moon ever, uh, in, uh, and, which NASA did last week. And I'm, I'm going, ah, no, actually, the Soviets did that in 1968. So uh, so I'm, I've am i become the fact checker for space. And that's led me into policy realms. Uh, uh, so the policy community invite me along sometimes to be sort of fact checker guy. And, uh, and that's led me to speak more widely on, on things that, are policy relevant that I care about, including space debris, uh, space weapons, and why they're a bad idea, and uh, uh, and more recently uh, the prob the environmental problems of satellite constellations. Uh, so that's sort of the brief, you know, who I am and 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 what I mean by the orbital police. Great. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan. Uh, we're we're glad to have you here and. Um, as, uh, as we go through this discussion, we want to just open uh, uh, up the Q&A feature for anyone in the audience that has a question for Jonathan uh, or what we're discussing today, please feel free to put it in the Q&A function and uh, we will get your, your question answered. But I will kick it off uh, first by kicking it right back to you, Jonathan. Your space report um, you know, really, as you said, has become a, a, uh, a resource of record, journal of record for um, you know, uh, uh, satellite, um, you know, satellite trajectories, space uh, traffic management, and, and all the sort of historic and, uh, and forward-looking, um, uh, you know, just the facts on what's going on in low Earth orbit and beyond. Um, have you found um, that this has come up in, you know, diplomacy in terms of norm setting and uh, international regulatory frameworks? Have they been able to bring you in either the the UN or um, or other other me uh, mechanisms that have been working on uh, space traffic management, space debris mitigation, things like this are are, are they using your uh, your your journal for that? And if not, how do we how do we get them to? Right. I mean, to some extent, yes. I I haven't had a lot of direct contact with, for example, the UN folks with the uh, uh, the diplomatic world. Although I have been involved with the. Uh, McGill Air and Space Law Institute, which which uh, is very active in in those sort of circles, and so so I know the people who talk to those people, if you like, one one remove, and I do get the sense that I get questions from you know someone in the government trying to research Chinese space or someone in the government trying to research uh, you know some aspect of of. Uh, uh, um, uh, policy related that they need some some data from. So I I, I think my data is getting out there, uh, and uh, you know, and that's great. And one of the things I do is that I make all of my uh, my data sets and my analysis plots open source, so that you know people can just use them and incorporate them in reports if they want to. On the other hand, my graphic design skills are non-existent, so they usually remake them in a prettier way. Uh, you have a certain aesthetic in the in Jonathan's uh, space report. It's it's uh, it's getting the facts out there. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll go through our, our panel. Um, so when we're talking about open source intelligence, this is maybe a, a, a newer um, area for, for some of our viewers. Can you describe the sort of satellite platforms that are used for open source intelligence now? What you know, kind of, if you could give us a, a, a you know, a, a past few decades um, uh, overview of where we were in terms of what was open source intelligence maybe a few decades ago versus what right. we have on offer now, both for looking at geopolitical issues on the ground and also for what you do is which is also tracking um, uh, you know, objects in space. Right, yeah, and that's you know, I would say in the eighties and nineties it was more about the latter, about uh, 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 what you. Uh, what you can tell about what's going on in space and and you know one of the fundamental things there is even if you try and you know if you're a military like the us and you want to have your satellite be secret uh the low orbit spy satellites are bright naked eye objects and you you uh you can't classify the sky and so it's it's actually remarkably easy to infer a lot about what's going on just from very simple observations, it doesn't require big radars or fancy, you know, multi-million dollar systems. It just requires binoculars and a stopwatch and some math. Uh, and uh, from looking at now the other way around, uh, uh, using space assets to um, 
uh, uh, for for open source intelligence about about the Earth, that is much more recent uh, because the ubiquity of commercial uh, imaging satellites is pretty recent. Uh, and so I think there, uh, you know, that was really the first, the, the, this started to become a big thing with a company called Planet, which has launched several hundred small CubeSats. And the images they return, you know, are not as good as the fancy, big, expensive spy sats, but they're good enough to learn a lot. And they're imaging the whole earth every day. And so news agencies really started getting into using this kind of stuff. Uh, and so that's been one source, but there's also things like um, uh, um, ADSB and AIS, which are these systems that track the locations of shipping, track the locations of airplanes, uh, famously in the last few days, track the location of Elon's jet, and he wasn't very happy about that. Uh, and and so uh, uh, you know, you can pull to, and, and the trick is right to pull together uh those different sources of public information uh with public information that's available through more conventional uh, uh journalism and uh and make sense of the big picture by by fusing that data by fusing the the conventional data with the data that we can get from uh, uh space imaging uh from uh space sensors that are essentially communications that are tracking uh what's going on and, and and you can really do do a lot with that great uh i i see a, a hand from uh from space diplomacy lab member lindsey gray so i'm going to go to lindsey and i'm going to uh go to ambassador pearson uh professor lundgren and uh, professor uh, zanaldo so lindsey go ahead dr, great, dr. Thank gray you so much um, so my question is a little bit more about uh, kind of the shifting work dynamic and professional backgrounds that I think are really required to be able to handle some of the topics that you have very rightly brought up. Uh, so right now, I think with the U.S. kind of academia system, most of those that have a strong background in cyber issues that know how to handle data, whether it's space or beyond, um, aren't really finding their way into government. And there's a whole slew of reasons why that's the case. And so I'm curious as we as we cast and see how we're moving towards systems where issues related to cybersecurity and open source data is gonna become all of the more vital um, and how we set norms and how we govern space. I'm curious to see or to really hear about where you think sort of the the main drivers of that are going to be coming from, or is it really still going to be from the private industry where those usually technical experts end up? Okay. Um, and if so, like where, how does that dynamic need to shift as we kind of are acquiring this like higher level of science expertise to be able to just really understand like what our satellites can do and what information we can get from them? Right. I mean, I think, you know, the the lead has been taken by organizations like SDL, organizations like particularly the Secure World Foundation, uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, organizations that are sort of independent think tanks uh, that uh, are where the scientists who end who go into policy tend to end up a lot of the time. And uh, uh, and I think that it's really had an effect um, that uh, certainly in the public discussion of a lot of these issues, uh, and, and I just want to give an example of, of how, you know, the there was a, uh, China was angry last year because SpaceX moved some of its Starlink satellites a bit close to the Chinese space station. And China's like, oh, this is outrageous. This is bad because here and here and here. And the U.S., said, oh, this is nonsense. Uh, uh, they were, you know, it wasn't even close, not an issue. And so who's telling the truth? How can you, uh, uh, what should we think about this? Uh, and so I was able to look at the public orbital data uh, 
and look at what I knew of the designs of the satellites and make some arguments about how in this particular case that I thought the Chinese had a point and, 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 you know, here's another independent view and here's the receipts, here's the data that shows what quantitatively what was actually going on. And, and that's the piece that's often missing when people with political agendas are shouting back and forth at each other. And, and so having that independent source of data, I think, has been useful in a, in a, in a lot of these uh, norm setting discussions. Um, having actual examples, historical examples of, you know, when this satellite came close to this other satellite and what actually happened, rather, rather than just making up uh you know uh moot court cases and things like that right um and and so 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 the question is how do those in instead of uh those think tanks how are we going to get these people actually into into government uh and uh i mean i think that has happened to a certain extent but uh um uh, i know in in the state department there are a few sort of former former astronomers who are who are there uh but uh um but yeah it, i i don't know career wise how that you know what that structure is uh one route right has been again for i know you know scientists and satellite engineers uh um and also you know military space people have gone through you know the space lawyer masters route <laughs> right to transform themselves into policy people uh and uh and that has uh you know that has generated what what flow there is i think into the into the policy community thank you jonathan thank you dr gray i'm going to uh have the next question from ambassador pearson over to you ambassador pearson. thank you very much and uh Delighted to be here, and Jonathan, very interested in your comments, and had happy to be here with the entire team today. Just one comment and then a question. I think that the State Department, I talked to the Director of Human Resources there three weeks ago. I got the impression that while they are not absolutely sure about what their choices would be, their intention is to do what Lindsey Gray would like to see done. Now, bureaucracies move slowly and budgets and uh, uh, and positions in hierarchies uh, have to open up and all that sort of thing. But I was struck with the fact that they have got it when it comes to knowing more about science and being able to talk about science intelligently with other diplomats around the world. So uh, it might be a candle, it might be a plague light, but in any case, it seems to be more than it was. So. I'm, I was happy to hear that. My question has to do with an uh, old, old and obvious issue. In everything human society considers to be of value, there is a combination of cooperation and conflict, and it will always be so. So the purpose that we had in trying to pursue anticipatory diplomacy is to see what we could see in the cooperation segment of this pie that might attenuate the conflict segment. And as you know, from your experience and even your most recent example, it's the part of the possible conflict segment that causes the most tension that gets the most that gets the most attention. So I'm wondering if you could help us a little bit with the cooperation segment and what you might see there uh, that might be useful for our future thinking and future global um, cooperation. You mean what are the what are the issues that are going to come up and hit us? Yes, but not only that, but as I have asked you before, and I apologize, have you got any supposed solutions that you'd like to right. offer uh, in that regard too? Yeah, well, I, I think that the uh, there are there are two areas that that I'm really concerned about at the moment. Uh, one uh, and one is in uh, Earth orbit, and the other is in deep space. Uh, I'll just briefly mention the deep space one, which is that well, well the, and the problem at the root is the same actually, which is that in the early years of the space age, when we were doing the outer space treaty and everything, there were basically two players. Right, there's the U.S. government and the Soviet government, and now it's not just that there's a lot more traffic in space but there are enormously more players. 
there are developing countries, there are startup companies. And so when there is a conflict between two entities and the list of entities is hundreds long, uh, there's even a problem in like, you know, who do you call, right? And who's responsible and how does that information flow? And uh, yes, the Outer Space Treaty says that the launching state still has to exercise jurisdiction and control, but in practice, that's uh, pretty thin right now. Uh, and and so uh, the the implication for that in in particularly in Earth orbit is um, with things like collision avoidance uh, and uh, or even liability. Uh, if you have, a, for example, a military anti satellite weapon and its debris hits my satellite uh you know who what how does that work out i i think the 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 but particularly the collision avoidance stuff i think the the, the vast number of different organizations involved uh requires a a shift in governance and i don't know what the solution is but it's got to be global it's got to be international and the uh, the the secondary part of that is that not only everyone has been talking about how china is coming up in in space and is sort of you know a competitor to the us but i hear much less about the fact that just in the past few years chinese commercial space has started to become incredibly active comparable to the us and so there are now many many chinese startups with their own satellite systems and so any attempt at space governments that that doesn't take that into account and try and draw them in to registration and information sharing and so forth uh, is going to miss the mark. Uh, and so I think that's the number one challenge is how do we draw the Chinese commercial space community into the international norms on space operations? Um, and then in deep space, uh, there, there's, again, many more players than there used to be. There has to be now space surveillance or at least space situational awareness in deep space, by which I mean the moon and beyond. Uh, and the US military has started talking about this and started, uh, uh, you know, lobbying politically, I guess, for a role in, in, in doing that. But unfortunately, that's been associated with an increase in rhetoric about how, oh, the Chinese are probably up to no good in deep space, which I think is just uh, a justification for territory, uh, uh, for for bureaucratic territory, rather than a real threat, and that's that's dangerous. So, so those are my uh, my two areas where I think um, uh, space diplomacy could really. Th there's an opportunity, and, and and the opportunity is that again in the Chinese commercial space, the more you have a you, the more your country's economy has commercial space uh, as a bigger sector than military space, the more incentive you have to avoid conflict in space. Very interesting. Thank you very much. That's a, those are two interesting ideas. Thank you. Great. And now I'm going to go to Professor Lundgren. And, and um, I, you're welcome to ask anything you, you'd like. But um, role of mega constellations and astronomy, I know, is near and dear to your heart. So I hope in one of your questions, you might ask uh, Jonathan something about that, uh, because I, I, I do know that he's uh, eager to help. Um, sure. Well, you snuck that question in. <laughs> then, no, no, ask um, it. Ask it in a, a real way, though. Not my. <laughs> I actually. Oh, can I come back to it? I, I have a, a question that's really burning. Sure. We'll we'll do um, multi, we'll do multiple rounds. So excellent. Uh, everyone, okay. get ready. Great. Yeah. So so um, Jonathan, it's great to be with you here today. Thanks for um, for being with us. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what seems to be a money saving decision to um, pursue uncontrolled deorbital plans for satellites um, and the challenges that presents both to uh, our ability to track those orbiting bodies. Um, and I, I assume you have probably the world's best expertise in that area, but also, you know, what um, uh, what that um, uh, technological decision, you know, means in terms of collision risks, um, Kessler syndrome, uh, and also, you know, not to mention the risks to humans. And I bring this up because there was a really provocative um, paper by Byers et al. in Nature earlier this year that you're probably aware of, um, which shared that um, just in 2020, over 60% of launches uh, to low Earth orbit were um, uh, resulting in a rocket body that was abandoned in orbit. 
And you know the the paper goes on to mention that the U.S. has policies um, to limit the um, the human casualty risk from those types of launches, but increasingly NASA and the Air Force are um, are kind of ignoring those regulations um, due to cost saving. Um, and the same goes uh, with policies that the UN has in place as well. So I'm I'm just wondering if you could speak to this a little bit. The the maybe most provocative piece in that paper was that. The people most at risk to actual falling debris from those kinds of uncontrolled orbits are in equatorial parts of the globe, which are disproportionately um, poorer nations that are not contributing to this problem at all. Right. And that comes uh, very simply from the, the physics, which is that uh, a lot of the uncontrolled reentries ultimately are from uh, rocket stages in geostationary transfer orbit, which are low inclination orbits, the orbits that are close to the equator. Uh, and and so when they re-enter, they re-enter you know in that that relatively narrow latitude range. Um, the but I, it's not a it's not a huge latitude dependence. I would say I think I, you don't want to read too much into that. It's not like there's no problem at higher latitudes. Um, so I think it is a global problem. Uh, I think you know historically right. People used to think ah, space debris re-entries aren't, aren't, aren't an issue. In 1979, the 80 ton Skylab fell on Australia and, and, and people went, oh, OK, yeah, maybe that's not such a great thing. But the threshold, the, but smaller things burn up completely and don't aren't an issue. It was the idea. And what is smaller, what is small enough not to worry about? that has shifted over the decades as we've realized that smaller and smaller objects actually can survive re-entry. Uh, and there's been a lot more attention in recent years, going back to the open source idea, uh, because of the ubiquity of dash cams and uh, other kinds of, you know, uh, uh, constant, you know, security cameras uh, looking at that can catch a re-entry in the sky or people with cell phones that are, they can go, oh, look at this, this, this thing burning up. And so what would have been something that made the local paper now makes international social media. Uh, and so we become much more aware of the this re-entering space debris, especially when it results in debris on the ground. Um, and so I think that it's clear we've been a bit too lax. And, and again, the other thing about it is just cumulative risk, right? Uh, if there's a risk, you know, of one casualty every every uh, 20 years uh, or something like that, then in the first 10 years, you, you kind of don't worry about it. But once now the space uh, age is 60 years old, um, <laughs> that, that, that expectation value doesn't start to look so good uh and so uh, there are additional concerns uh there are concerns with uh the sheer as we move into and this relates to the mega constellations when you go from you know a few thousand large satellites to tens or hundreds of thousands of large satellites uh being changed out in a silicon valley rapid design kind of way every few years uh, and you're re-entering, let, letting those do uncontrolled re-entries. Um, again, the statistics change, but also the amount of, of, of metals that you're adding to the upper atmosphere uh, starts to become perhaps significant, and you have to redo the calculations on upper atmosphere chemistry to see if you need to worry about that. Uh, and so there's a whole range of policy issues that come from the increase in traffic, and, and I think that we do need to um to relook at these regulations and so there has been a change in the US uh where the rule used to be oh, uncontrolled reentries are fine if they're reasonably small uh, objects but they've got to happen within in low earth orbit 25 years of you switching off your satellite so and that's just to avoid the collision risk in orbit uh, and uh now they're going to they say they're going to reduce that to 5 years I don't think that's remotely adequate. I, I think it needs to be one year at least. Um, and uh, and so people need to do studies on this and really uh, uh, the studies that have been done suggest that, that really five doesn't make much of a difference compared to 25. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, I think it's a problem. Uh, I think I, I'll say one other thing. The, pr the difference 
I mean, so the technical thing that policy people need to understand is the difference between an active deorbit and an uncontrolled reentry, right? Where an active deorbit, you're up at maybe 400 kilometers in a circle, you fire your engine, and suddenly you're in an orbit that goes from 400 to 10, and 45 minutes later, you enter the atmosphere at a very particular time and place that you can predict, like the South Pacific, hopefully, <laughs> and, uh, 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 and reliably burn up at that moment. If, however, you do an uncontrolled re-entry, your orbit stays circular and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until it's body surfing the upper atmosphere, and then the heating is uniform around the orbit. You don't, you can't predict where it's finally going to break up. Uh, if you predict, if you're off by one hour in when the final breakup is going to be, you're off by 17,000 miles because that's the speed of the spacecraft. And so you can't predict uh, if it's a large object where the debris is going to fall in advance. And that's just fundamental physics. And so, so that's why uncontrolled reentries are, uh, are a concern. So we want to avoid an orbital roulette wheel. Exactly. I do worry. It seems like an academic debate at this point, but as soon as someone's actually injured or killed by an uncontrolled deorbit, I feel like um, hopefully policy debate will become more common on this and and have yeah, some. Yeah, I think so. I, well, I, I see a I see a lot more discussion. In the academic literature, at least, but also in the policy arena uh, uh, of this in recent years. But it's just, you know, as you know, I, I mean, the, the other fundamental thing, as astronomers, right, we always worry about time scales. What's the time scale of this compared to the time scale of that? And unfortunately, the regulatory development time scale is negligible compared, uh, is, is large compared to the uh, space industrialization time scale. And, and, and so I think diplomatically, that's one of the fundamental problems. How do you reconcile those very two very different time scales? And, and maybe I should now make good on my promise to Ben and ask you about uh, the impact on astronomy, both in terms of light pollution and um, impact to uh, our orbiting observatories. Um, what, what keeps you up at night as someone who knows where everything is? Right. I mean, I do, from the astronomy point of view, I do worry about the uh, the big constellations and their effect on, on both on the, you know, when, when a satellite comes over while you're taking a picture, it leaves a big streak on your image. Uh, if that happens one every 10 images you take, eh, you throw it away and, you know, it's an overhead. If there are 10 streaks on every image, that becomes a real problem that is very hard to mitigate for the sort of level of accuracy that, that, that you and I try and get from our data, right? Where we're not just trying to take a pretty picture, we're trying to make 1% level measurements of, uh, of brightnesses of things. So, um, so we are, you know, when you look at all the different satellite constellations that are proposed now across the world uh, and see how much is that gonna add up to if they really all launch uh, and go how many, bright moving things is that per square degree uh it it does get to be in the regime where ground-based astronomy is going to be in big trouble but equally uh the um the radio transmissions from these satellites are a huge threat to radio astronomy uh there are certain uh broadcasts that are uh non legally restricted to uh ground-based services and not for satellite services certain certain frequency ranges and so on and the satellite companies are trying to finesse that and claim that well they're sort of doing a kind of ground-based service so they're just going to broadcast in that band anyway even though it's protected against and that's going to really destroy radio astronomy so so i think there are you know we're just seeing this enormous tidal wave of in space industrialization come at us and and the little scientists are going oh please no wait but you said that you wouldn't do that and and it's just <laughs> running us over not to mention that that science is a public investment on large scales absolutely. absolutely absolutely and it's an internet you know it, it's decisions that are being made at a national level that affect the whole world is the, uh, the other thing. I mean, particularly, I think there, there are two problems with the mega constellations in terms of the night sky. One is the high orbit constellations that are not visible to the naked eye, but are damaging to professional astronomy. And then there's the low orbit constellations like Starlink that probably aren't that bad for most 
ground-based astronomy, although some, but have the potential to change the night sky for the average person in a dark side. And, and so if we're changing the view of the sky for the whole world, we should probably have, even if it has a good outcome, like cheap internet for everyone, remains to be seen, but that's the argument, um, we should at least have that discussion at an international level and not just by the FCC. Great, well, thank you so much, Professor Lundgren. Uh, I'm gonna go to uh, Professor Zinalda next. Um, well, I think I know what his question is going to be, but I'm not going to presume anymore. What I uh, my my guessing has been uh, been off today. Thank you, Ben. But before I ask my question, I want to ask a question on behalf of one of our colleagues, uh, Professor Jonathan Wiener. He's a professor of law here at Duke University, and he has published extensively on um, legal slash policy related issues to uh, to space related to space. Uh, so thank you, Jonathan, for submitting this question. Um, from uh, uh, Professor Wiener, what kind of legal reforms or additional governance mechanisms do you recommend to govern, to govern space debris and related Earth orbit issues going beyond the existing regimes such as the Outer Space Treaty, Artemis Accords, et cetera? Right, it's a problem because, you know, treaties are so 20th century. Uh, the, the great powers now are really not interested in committing themselves to do anything uh, that that they don't want to do. And so the success that we have had has been by these more um, soft diplomacy instruments, I think, that like, for example, the, the technocratic recommendations of the Interagency Debris Committee, where, uh, uh, which is, you know, which is uh, critically not seen as a US-led thing, uh, and uh, it, it involves representatives from different space agencies and makes these technocratic engineering recommendations about how far above geostationary orbit should you put the geostationary graveyard. And then individual countries, while not compelled to follow those recommendations, when they're looking for a recommendation for their own national regulations, it's easiest for them just to pick the one that IADC has, has, has recommended. Uh, and so I think pushing on that kind of norm uh, rather than trying to get binding treaties is the realistic approach in the current political situation. Uh, and, and so we have to appeal to, to individual countries' self-interests in, in, uh, and companies' self-interest in, in the bottom line in, in not in, in making space sustainable. And there's been some progress, uh, I think, along those lines. I worry the, the example of the Artemis Accords, which I think is seen as a US-led effort. And so I think it's gonna be very, it, it sort of raises the hackles perhaps of China and Russia. Uh, I, I don't know how to get around that, um, but I think one does have to build uh, um, uh, some, some framework that particularly lets China in and let, uh, is, is acceptable to China. And, uh, and my hope is that as Europe gets its act together more in space in the European Union, um, that they can be a leader in this area uh, because they're seen you know, as less immediately uh, trying to tell everyone else what to do, <laughs> which is the impression that the US uh, initiatives often give. Uh, thank you, uh, Jonathan. And uh, on on this uh, issue, because we have been discussing in the in our program about treaties, agreements, and all different options, I want to ask uh, from Ambassador Pearson to add something to to this point of uh, you know diff what type of uh, ideal uh, agreements we should. Uh, look forward to, uh, especially in terms of space. Uh, thank you, Giovanni. I'm not sure quite how to ask the question. So uh, Jonathan, please treat it in any style you think is best. But uh, direct launch kinetic weapon uh, uh, technology is available uh, to all the great powers. And the US has stated that it's not going to do that anymore and has attracted six, seven, eight other countries. And I think over time will continue to attract. That's an example 
of the Americans naively or boldly or inexpertly trying to set a standard that others will adopt and will become a normative mode of behavior. Then you have the Artemis Accords, which I agree is an American idea, but it now two African states joined this week. So um, now there will be some effort made for them to be included in the process. So how, how if you're an American, how is it that you're going to act as a convener Mm -hmm. And 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 I would say without being pejorative that no one trusts the Chinese or the Russians to be conveners. Uh, how how do the Americans act as conveners without looking like they're throwing their weight around in the room? Right, that's fair. And I I you know you got me because uh, you're absolutely right. The anti-satellite uh, ban is is actually a great example of the U.S. showing successful leadership. And I applaud it. Uh, I think it's a great move and it, it does seem to be picking up traction. So, um, uh, but on the other hand, you know, it's what are the chances of the Russians signing up to that? Well, you know, maybe not much, but if you can get enough other countries uh, on board, maybe it becomes a norm uh, and the Russians, you know, look more and more excluded. Um, so, uh, um, how, I mean, I, think the answer is that you build inter you the US builds participation in international bodies like the IADC and you know similar kinds of thing right uh, that are maybe not UN because you know you can't wait for 500 countries to get on board but but uh uh but maybe you know five countries and before you put the you know uh, and, and it should come from that sort of body a body where the us is a participant and maybe a convener but not necessarily a leader uh rather than it be a us initiative i think i think that's the the way to do it and that but that requires the U.S. delegation at that body to actually, you know, listen to the Europeans and listen to the Indians and listen to that, rather than just uh, uh, try and get them on board, whatever the U.S. idea is. Uh, and I think that is, you know, a, a, sometimes my impression is, uh, as someone who grew up, you know, in the U.K., as someone who grew up outside of, of, of the U.S. for the most part, that, that uh, um the U.S. isn't always uh, uh, sincere about listening, even to its allies, and so, um, so, so a little more humility maybe would would go a long way. Well, I will confess that having had two tours at NATO, I understand perfectly what you mean. Uh, but I think it's a great suggestion that maybe through international bodies that already exist where the U.S. is a member, there may be room for normative behavior setting that the U.S. could be overlooking right now. So thank you. Great. Thank we'll you. Uh, go over to Dr. Gray for the next question. And we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll so do a, just, oh yeah, go ahead. So just one, I, I would like to ask my question. Uh, um, and this has to do also with my interest is in uh, space economy and space economics. And uh, it sounds probably a very uh, childish question uh, to an astrophysicist and astronomer uh, in the room. Uh, it's about this, um, the Lagrange point. And uh, the reason I'm asking this is because more and more we read about the Lagrange points, and it seems that everybody is going uh, to occupy the Lagrange points. And uh, so from an economic point of view, it, it's becoming a sort of primary real estate. And uh, so again, for the lay audience, including me, uh, how much space we, there is, if, if we can not determine that, but if we can say that, and uh, why these particular points are becoming so irrelevant, so relevant for all right. kind of missions and also for space debris because of the, the since they are going to be stuck there, etc. So what's the future of uh, traffic in uh, and, uh, and parking in uh, in the Lagrange points? Well, let me let me take that. I'll answer that. But let me first uh, put some context more generally, which is that 
uh, my colleague Martin Elvis here at uh, the Center for Astrophysics has been writing quite a bit about how there are, you know, not all bits of space are equivalent and some bits of space are more valuable and therefore more subject to competition. Uh, and the example he mostly talks about is the South Pole of the Moon, where there might be water and things like that. Uh, and so I think it is, therefore, from the policy point of view, important to understand which bits of space are valuable for what reasons uh even though it's some of it's like empty space but this piece of empty space is a lot more valuable than that piece of empty space geostationary orbit is another of course classic example so let's talk about the lagrange points um and uh, they are uh, and the quick answer to your question is uh although the lagrange points are sort of a point in fact uh the spacecraft orbits in the vicinity of little Grange points are huge and there's plenty of space and that is the place where i am least worried about crowding mm -hmm. uh and so just to then go in a little more detail what a lagrange point is um we for me the uh, uh this is about the move from um the focus of space activity being in earth orbit to going further out to deep space and when you're in Earth orbit, you can ignore the gravity of the moon, you can ignore the gravity of the sun, you can ignore the gravity of Jupiter, and you can go back to our old friend Johannes Kepler and say you're in a nice elliptical orbit around the Earth. Uh, but once you get to the point where the moon's gravity is becoming as important as the Earth, so the sun's gravity is going, uh, you, you, you enter these regions where trajectories are a lot more complicated. And so uh, your friend and mine, Joseph-Louis Lagrange, <laughs> uh, in the 1770s, I think, uh, figured out that if you have two worlds or two bodies, like the Earth and the Sun, then, and you ask, where does the gravity balance between them in a certain sense? And one way of thinking about it is, if I'm close to the Earth, I can ignore the Sun and say I'm in orbit around the Earth. If I'm way away from the Earth, I can ignore the Earth and say I'm in orbit around the Sun. Uh, but there's a region where you've got to take both into account, uh, a border region, and, and that's called the Hill Sphere. And on the Hill Sphere, there are these two Lagrange points, L1 and L2. So there are, there are certain points at which the gravity of two bodies balance in a particular technical sense. Uh, and so if you hang out, near that balance point you can pretend you're orbiting this invisible point in space when really what you're doing is playing off uh, diplomats will understand this one playing off one party against the other <laughs> right um and uh and so um uh, and so so it's a one of the cool things about that is that because the gravity is balanced if you make a very small change to your orbit you and wait, then you end up in an extremely different place, which is another way of saying, if you go out to the Lagrange point and then back, you can end up somewhere very different with very little expense of fuel. So that's one use of them. And then the other use is just, you can hang out there with very little expense of fuel. And the Lagrange, the, the key Lagrange points that we've mostly used up till now are the Sun-Earth Lagrange points one and two, Sun-Earth L1 is a million miles towards noon. It's in the direction of the sun. Uh, so the sun's 93 million miles away. If you go 1 million miles along that track, you get to L1. And that's great for science satellites that want to study the sun. If you go the other direction, a million miles towards midnight, then that's nice and dark. The Earth and the sun are behind you. In front of you is deep space with nothing to mess your telescope up. And so that's where all the astronomy telescopes are going now. But the orbit that you take around L2 to stay there has a radius of about the radius of the orbit of the moon around the Earth, hundreds of thousands of miles. And so right now we have like 10 spacecraft out there in a region that's a couple hundred thousand miles across. So, so there's plenty of space at the Lagrange points. That what's now coming in to play are the Earth-Moon Lagrange points. And they are, again, along the Earth-Moon line, uh, about 40,000 miles from the surface of the Moon in either direction. And so the Chinese have a relay satellite beyond the Moon. 
uh, the Artemis uh, uh, mission was 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 playing around with a special orbit that is uh, in a similar region. And so that's a somewhat smaller volume of space. And there, at the moment, it's not a problem, but eventually we may have traffic issues at the Earth Moon Lagrange points. Thank you very much. And Giovanni, can you can you just tell the audience why uh, Lagrange uh, is near and dear to your heart? <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> Lagrange is originally, well, was born in uh, Torino, where I, I was born too, and I grew up in uh, very close to where he lived uh, uh, when before he moved to first to, to Prussia and then to, to France. So anyway, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, Ben, there is a question from the uh, audience if you want to ask that one. Yeah, so what I'll do is a uh, question from the audience Then I'm gonna go in the same order. We're gonna do a lightning round or a warp speed round or some sp space equivalent of a lightning round. Uh, for all of our, our panelists from the Space Diplomacy Lab to ask uh, maybe a, a one-minute question and with a one-minute uh, response or two-minute response, and, and uh, that's that's where we'll go. So first from the, the uh, audience, uh, Ken Hodgkins asks, uh, Jonathan, any thoughts on civil society uh, versus uh, governments setting norms of behavior for sustaining Earth orbits? Right. Well, I think, you know, that... Um, that is the role of 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 you know the sort of study groups and think tanks right is to put out position papers and go you know we should really you know here's how you should think about this issue uh uh and the question is how are you going to persuade people to adopt that uh, and in particular now that that question for me becomes how do you uh how do you persuade satellite companies commercial satellite companies to adopt these norms. And uh, usually, you know, these issues, right, which are typically kind of environmental issues go the same way as other environmental issues, which is uh, the short-term profits uh, are in conflict with the goals of the long-term environmental concern. And that is the role of government, is to regulate uh, uh, commercial activity to take into account these long-term, long time scale externalities uh, uh, and factor them into the uh, the economic equation. And so, so I don't immediately see how you can get around, you know, the the the, the civil society can propose or 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 you know uh, uh, put forward what the measures should the norms yeah. should be, but ultimately government regulation is going to have to be involved. Great. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Dr. Gray, Lindsay, next. Okay, well, I'm going to bring we're it in, back. We're in hyperspace now, whatever. whatever. Go whatever. quickly, yes. So I am really curious to circle back to this term orbital police and sort of how that can be used as a way to uh, like name expectations for norms in space, name and shame when someone is not mm -hmm. behaving accordingly and also, as you've pointed out, your own career, fact check. So I know we've talked about sort of the formalizing that in government regulations, in treaties, in these formal settings, but what about democratizing that process a bit? So what role or tool can you know, the, the general public or the civilian demographic use to essentially also require good behavior in outer space, whether it's through social media or these open source data platforms that are becoming more and more prevalent? So as you know, Britt mentioned earlier, we're not having people being put um, at risk when you know things fall from the sky. Yeah. Well, I, I think you know you your your phrase name and shame is the key one there. That's how the general public and the uh, civil society can uh, can have an influence uh, because it's it's all too easy for you know governments to kind of shove things under the the carpet. Uh, um, for example, I did a lot of work on the registration convention, which says you have to register your satellite with the UN, and I named and shamed, you know, a lot of people who weren't doing that right, and things have improved. I don't know how much was thanks to me, but I like to think it was at least partly. Uh, and and so so I I do think that that you know history shows not just in the space arena that that um, yeah talking about these issues and pointing them out and going. Oh look over there! That's hypocritical, <laughs> and so on. Uh, does have an effect in go on governments in the long term. So, so that's my answer. 
Uh, I'm going to pepper in one one corollary there, Jonathan. You mentioned, uh, you know, in court, right? Is there's no international space court at this point, but what you know, what would you think, you know, decades or or years down the road needs to happen for um, actual enforcement of norms once they they become regulations? Right. I mean, we need so so one of the problems right now is that everyone in the world basically depends on the US Space Force for the satellite catalog. Uh, I mean, the Russians have their own, but they don't make it public. And so so uh, and, and yet that's problematic because they don't want the Space Force to tell them what to do. Uh, so there's no equivalent of air traffic control, which says satellite A move up, satellite B move down. Uh, and we need to get to that, I think. And I think the first way to get to that is just to have an international space surveillance, space situational awareness agency uh, that combines, uh, you know, U.S. data from the Commerce Department ultimately, combines European data, hopefully combines Chinese data at some point, uh, and and uh, have that be initially just an information exchange, here's what's going on, but evolve that to an agency that actually can tell you what to do uh, in terms of space traffic management. That's my, my vision. Great. Uh, Ambassador Pearson, I think I'm going in the right order. Anyways, Ambassador Pearson, then uh, then uh, Professor Lundgren, then, then Professor Zimmer. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Two comments, really. One is in maritime law, there's now a normative uh, behavior standard for pollution. Uh, it isn't uh, required uh, in the sense that everybody has to sign up for it, but people have. And naming and shaming, as Dr. Gray mentioned, is a is a very effective way of reducing the level of dumping from trade from uh, freighters and tankers and so on at sea. So there's an example that could be formed into a space normative behavior given enough time and work. And secondly, for your questioner who asked about civil society, in collaborative negotiation diplomacy theory, there are two ways to have the outcome you want. One is to be a source of power and and deal with people at the first table, I'll call it, uh, to get your uh, solution adopted. And the other one is a leverage policy by which you pick the most likely targets to be persuaded by what you advocate and make them the leverage of power and resources and money to affect the result that you want. So I would just suggest maybe looking at the leverage theory of uh, collaborative diplomacy as a way to um, make headway on your issues. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with everything you say there. I think that's, that, that's exactly right. Um, and I think, you know, further uh, to uh, Dr. Gray, Professor Gray's question, uh, um, you know, I encourage people to become familiar with the various open source, uh, you know, like Google Satellite View, but also there's the Sentinel uh, uh, stuff in, in Europe that, that let you, you know, look at the Earth from space and, and figure out exactly where things are. And you can, you know, you can do your own uh, assessment of uh where the um uh you know where the facilities are that are controversial whether they're really uh, a problem so uh um so yeah it, it's it's uh um the, the there's a lot of tools out there on the internet that you can that can, you know provide space data that you can just look at for free and then a bunch more where you have to pay um, and I really appreciate uh, Ken's uh, uh, comment in the chat. Ken, Ken says that he, uh, Ken Hodgkin says, by the way, Jonathan, I managed the US registry at the State Department and took to heart your naming and shaming. Staff did loads of work to straighten things out. That's great. Great to have you here, Ken. Uh, okay, uh, thank you, Ambassador Pearson. Uh, Professor Lundgren. Great, yeah, just a quick uh, logistical question about um, this um, this aspect of your professional life. 
Um, Jonathan, I, I was wondering how much time do you put into the space report? And, um, you know, it's it's critically important. And I think this idea of having a kind of flight control that's available worldwide is great, but it's maybe problematic to have it funded by the typical channels that you would fund your other scientific research. Um, I see you have disclaimers about how your space report is not uh, presenting any opinions by your employers or grant um, grant right. agencies. So I wonder if you could just um, give us a little yeah. insight on that that yeah, goes that goes I, for the space diplomacy lab as well <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well you know i uh um i do it on my own time is the answer uh you know i i don't do it nor i mean i guess this is working hours but but that, that's a slightly different thing but in terms of the actual space report i've been very careful uh you know not to use uh um you know employer resources or employer time uh to do it and and so but you know i've been building my list of satellites for 50 years now since i was you know 10 <laughs> and uh, so so uh i've got it down to a fine art and every, and this is why you know we were talking earlier about how crappy my website is and it's because everything is about the minimal amount of time for me to get the content out there right and I, other people can spend time making it pretty because I'm doing this in my spare time and and so it, it's a question of of um uh getting as much value for that limited time that I can put in uh, uh so that's that's that part of the answer um uh and uh um uh you know how do we fund this properly <laughs> right is uh you know there are uh, I think, uh, again, I've already mentioned things like Secure World and UCS, who I think do a great job. Um, and uh, um, I think, you know, they're all of these foundations, right, are having trouble right now with funding. Uh, and so that's a bigger question of how we fund these civil society uh, uh, projects that uh, are, are critical to public understanding objective public understanding of what's going on um and as so i've been i've taken the view i don't want money because i don't want to be beholden to anyone and i can say i can i can you know be blunt about anything i want to be blunt about hopefully not in a not in an asshole way but um uh, uh so um uh yeah so it's 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 a quite it's a very it's a it's the critical question and i don't have an answer for it Thank you, Jonathan. And again, we that those are your words. We uh, we we appreciate the aesthetic of Jonathan's face report. We'll leave it. We'll leave it at that. I appreciate the service that you do. Okay. Um, I, I was talking to uh, Professor Zinaldo in the chat. I, I'm going to do a quick lightning round myself. A couple of quick questions, uh, and then we'll we'll kick it over to you, Jonathan, for final thoughts. But uh, fast question: Space Coast Guard versus Space Force. What do you think? Say. So say again sorry space coast guard versus uh, space force yeah i think space coast guard would have been better um you know i i'm not the degree of pacifist who think we shouldn't have a military of course we should have a military we do need the defense uh uh thing but you know so far we've avoided the you know, the the things that the space force actually do in space right now are largely a coast guard kind of function and I think that if you called it the Space Coast Guard, you know, you, you would be in a better mindset to say, all right, let's protect our, our space assets, but we're not here to, you know, invade Mars or something like that, right? And, and, uh, and so it, it would reduce the temptation of cer for certain generals to kind of hype, overhype the, the threat uh that may you know not that there aren't some threats but there's a lot of overhyping of threats i think and a lot of you know what i'll mention one thing is that every time a u.s military figure complains about a space activity by china or russia you need to ask did the u.s do, do exactly the same thing last year <laughs> and usually the answer is yes uh and so so that's that's my feeling about coast guard versus space force Okay, moving space surveillance from low Earth orbit to geostationary and cis lunar space. Thoughts on that? 
Right. Well, I think there's progress being made on geostationary, uh, although it is a bit ironic that the U.S. GSSAP satellites uh, often have their orbits classified when they're meant to be made doing, you know, doing the satellite catalog work uh, for everybody. Um, uh, I think astronomers would be, you know, have the right skills and the right technology to do the deep space uh, uh, situational awareness. And we already have been doing it. The asteroid uh, searchers keep discovering asteroids that turn out to be lost pieces of deep space junk <laughs> and go, oh, whoops, okay, that uh, that asteroid maneuvered is probably not an asteroid. Um, and so, uh, uh, so I think they would be a more natural home for deep space surveillance than the military. Great. Uh, I'm going to ask you a question. I, I said I would ask on space sanctions. By that, I mean um, enforcement of sanctions regimes uh, using open source intelligence from space. Um, as as uh, many in the audience might know, the uh, international community uh, put out a uh, an oil price cap on Russian oil uh, over the past mm -hmm. uh, few weeks, uh, and that's going to require tracking vessels uh, around the world to make sure that they are uh, they're complying with this this new what is effectively a sanctions regime uh, on the Russian Federation um, on the high seas. But as you yourself said, uh, tracking mechanisms, uh, open source tracking mechanisms like um, AIS can be switched off. And so I just want to get your thoughts on the extent to which uh, optical and RF data sources can help uh, close those gaps in an open source uh, perspective for those that are tracking uh, these vessels worldwide. Right. I, I think it's hard to do that. Um, you really need your space-based assets to do this tracking. There is a, a, a new commercial market in maritime surveillance using <clears throat> a technology that the uh, National Reconnaissance Office and the U.S. Navy developed in the 1970s uh, with uh, intercepting radio signals from ships. Uh, and that's now commercialized, and there are commercial companies uh, um, that uh, that have constellations of satellites doing this. Uh, and uh, uh, um, But that data is not public and open source. Okay, and then uh, finally, on uh, the International Space Station, we, we see that in about two years, uh, in 2024, at least on paper, uh, the Russians have said that they may leave the agreement, and um, we'll see what, what actually happens. What do you see for the future of uh, space cooperation between the U.S. and Russia post-ISS? Eventually, it will end. Um, right. And I'll, I'll add as a corollary, uh, whereas there's been a long history of cooperation with, with Russia over, you know, from the, the Soviet era till now, we haven't had that sort of cooperation with China. Do we need to have that cooperation specifically with Russia you know, in, in light of geopolitical context? So just thoughts on that, that sort of dynamic. Right. I think, um, you know, first to say the 2024 thing is basically a mistranslation uh, that what the Russians said were, was, we'll, we're, we're not going to leave the ISS before 2024. Right. So it's a no earlier than not a we're we're hitting the road there. Uh, so I think it likely that ISS cooperation will continue beyond that, but not much beyond that, because, yeah, geopolitically, it no longer makes sense, I think, for uh, uh, for the U.S. to um, uh, to be in partnership with Russia. And you know, already you know, the idea is right to get rid of the ISS and to move the U.S. space human spaceflight budget to Artemis and Orion and Gateway uh, out at the moon. And the uh, Russians are already not involved in that. Uh, and so I think that uh, the I mean, and that will leave the Russian civilian space program essentially unfunded uh and i think that we're we've already seen in the past few years uh russia which used to be sort of if you like equal leading space power with the us is now dropping to a second rank space power as china replaces it as the uh the the main um uh, sort of comp main peer uh in in space so yeah we got it we We've got to engage the Chinese. I think that's critical. Uh, we don't have to like them, you know. We don't have to trust them even, but but we have to engage them and get some kind of modus vivendi, some kind of uh, uh, you know, working with. I mean, one of the things that the ISS did do very well 
is it brought the Russians closer in terms of norms to, to how they operate in space? And uh, 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 and so I, I, I think that there's a lot to be said for, for that. I, I think that we can just, uh, you know, but I think you can write off the Russian space program in the long term. I, I think they're, uh, it's, it's on the way down. Okay, thank you. That's that's all great context, and we just want to uh, close out by giving you an opportunity for maybe a minute or two of uh, of closing remarks. Uh, any thoughts and wisdom you've already imparted so much wisdom, of course, to us uh, uh, of um, what the future holds, uh, what we can do, and how space diplomacy uh, can can continue to contribute and grow going forward. Right. Um, well, I think you know the 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 thing I want to leave you with is just a reminder that. Space is intrinsically global. All the satellites are orbiting in all different directions. There's not a US lane and a Russian lane, uh, and they're passing over different countries every few minutes. And so ultimately, nation by nation solutions are not adequate. You have to have an international approach uh, that includes everybody. Uh, and, and so, the more conversations we can have, the more global outlook we can have uh, in, in engaging space, the, the, uh, uh, the more successful we're likely to be. Uh, and then the other thought is just to repeat this issue of the, uh, of the challenge of hundreds of startups and hundreds of, of uh, developing country organizations uh, making the, uh, instead of a, a, a bipolar superpower uh, space environment, uh, just makes things ever so much more complicated. And so maybe that's somewhere where presenting for maybe, you know, one one of the challenges, I think, and, and, and the U.S. Uh, licensing process has sort of been trying to do this for the U.S., is make it easy for new players to learn the norms and adopt the norms and do the paperwork, right? And, and maybe that's something that civil society can do on in an international basis. Uh, uh, so, so, you know, that's one, one way we could go. So thank you very much for, for, uh, uh, for having me along. Well, thank you, uh, Jonathan McDowell of uh, the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, uh, physics, uh, physics uh, X-ray astronomer and uh, author of Jonathan's Space Report. Uh, thank you to uh, Ambassador Pearson and Professor Zinalda from Duke University's uh, Rethinking Diplomacy Program, as well as Lindsey Gray uh, and uh, uh, of, of the uh, State Department and Professor Lundgren of the um, uh, of UNC Asheville. All of which are part of the Rethinking Diplomacy's Space Diplomacy Lab. Again, we had full attendance today. So excited. Uh, and so this has been a, a a presentation of the Duke University. Uh, Space Diplomacy Lab. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Jonathan McDowell, uh, my colleague here at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Uh, I'm Benjamin Schmidt saying so long from Cambridge, Massachusetts, and as always, uh, closing out by saying keep looking up. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you also to the Tide Foundation for supporting our program. And best Thanks wishes for, for the new year.